All right, what is up? Welcome back. Uh, my name is Noah. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And today's video, I want to dive into some of the better running backs in this year's draft class. I'm going to be breaking down three guys who are kind of consensus top three guys in this class, contenders for RB1. I will not be talking about Isaiah Spiller because I've already done that and I don't think he's a legitimate RB1 level guy in this class. But I will be talking about Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, Kyron Williams kind of comparing them side by side, like deep diving into their profiles as a whole, seeing what we can learn about these guys. So I'm going to go category by category, address like each component of their overall profiles, and then yeah, we'll go from there. First of all, we'll kind of dive into the physical measurables. We don't have a lot if, like, we don't really have any. The combine hasn't happened yet, so we don't have any uh, athletic testing data yet. But we do have heights and weights. So, Brees Hall, this last year at Iowa State, was listed at 6'1", 220. I did some work, some research about just a couple weeks ago using historical data of running backs who go on to like eventually be drafted and their listed weights as like high school recruits each year in college and then their eventual combine or pro day weights to see if how well and if we can predict eventual combine and pro day weights using data from the time they're a high school recruit or a freshman or a sophomore like whatever year it is how well can we project their eventual NFL weights the answer is pretty well and so using that data I've kind of formulized a method to project combine weights for these guys. And so I'll use those here. I project Brees Hall to be just shy of six foot at the combine and 222 pounds, which would put him in like the JHI Rashad Penny range, you know, really solidly built dudes can handle a lot of work. That's Brees Hall. Kenneth Walker, this last year at Michigan State was listed at 5'10", 210 pounds, which is solid, not big, like a little below average, but solid. Interesting about his listed weights, um, he spent... The first two years of his career at Wake Forest, where he was listed at, I believe, 200 pounds both seasons, 5'10", 200, which is too tall and too skinny. <laughs> we don't want to see that from our NFL running backs. Based on his yearly kind of weight gain pattern, I project he'll be 5'9 and a quarter and 211 pounds at the combine, which would not be bad. That would put him in like Daryl Henderson, Kareem Hunt range as far as like proportional build. However, my guy Chris Moxley on Twitter from campus to Canton.com, you can find him at Chris Moxley 19. That's M-O-X-L-E-Y. Anyway, Chris Moxley did a lot of research on which colleges tend to over or undershoot the eventual listed weights of their guys on their like online rosters. And what he found was that Michigan State is the sixth worst offender in inflating the listed weights of their guys, like at least of their running backs. Running backs from Michigan State weigh on average four and a half pounds less at the combine than they did during their final season at Michigan State, which does not bode well for Kenneth Walker. If he follows that pattern, he'll be right around like 5'10", 5'9", and 205 pounds which doesn't sound like an incredibly large difference, like 205 pounds, 211 pounds, who gives a fuck? But for Kenneth Walker in particular, given that he doesn't catch a lot of passes, which I'll kind of like dive into later, but given that he doesn't catch a lot of passes, his size is really important. Ideally, we want guys to be big and catch passes. Like we like David Johnson. We like Le'Veon Bell. We like Saquon Barkley. But if you are not big, you better catch passes. Like Christian McCaffrey's not a big dude. He's like 5'10", 5'11", 205. So he's light and relatively skinny, but he obviously is a great receiver. So he can get a lot of work and like do what he does on the field. If you're small and or skinny and you don't catch passes, the odds of you getting three down work even getting on the field for a lot of two down work are very low. So the range of outcomes here, I'm really interested to see Kenneth Walker at the combine. He could be anywhere from like 5'9", 210 to, you know, 5'10", 205, which is a big difference. That could take him from Daryl Henderson range to being built proportionally like Tony Pollard or Tevin Coleman, like these taller, skinnier guys. And if you're relatively tall and skinny and you don't catch passes, not a good look. There's not a lot of success stories with that body type. Kyron Williams, this last year at Notre Dame was listed at 5'9", 199, which I like to see a school list a guy at 199 versus 200. Not because it's any better, but I think it shows an attention to detail and it's something that like we can more readily trust. If he was 200, maybe he's 193 and they just round it up to make him look good. 
But if he stepped on a scale and he's 199 and they wrote down 199, like he's probably 199. So pretty confident in Kyron Williams having actually been 199 last year. Based on historical data, projected to be 5'9", 204 at the combine, which is right there in like James White, Miles Gaskin range. He's not a very big dude either, but unlike Kenneth Walker, he's a great receiver. So it matters a little less for him there's a role that he can play as a small guy. Let's dive into the production profiles of these players and start with Brees Hall again. He broke out year one, was immediately a great player at Iowa State, 18.3 years old as a breakout. It's a 97th percentile breakout age. And his freshman season dominator rating was 21%. That's in the 80th percentile for true freshmen. And then as a sophomore, 38%. 44% as a junior. Those are 94th and 95th percentile numbers. So he was just like a legitimately dominant college producer up there with like the best guys we've seen come out of college in the last 15 plus years. His counting stats, 1,100 yards, 10 touchdowns as a freshman, and then 1,700 yards and 23 touchdowns right around there, both as a junior and a senior. The teams that he was playing on is another kind of piece of this pie. Like it's a lot different if you have 1,700 yards and 20 touchdowns at Georgia versus doing that at UTEP, obviously. So I like to take into account like the level of program that these guys are playing at. Iowa State is a power five conference, but they're not like a powerhouse school. They went seven and six, nine and three, seven and six these past three years. So like they're a decent team. One metric that I like to use to kind of quantify how well or how good a team is outside of just like their win loss record, basically, is Bill Connolly over at ESPN, his S&P plus rating system, which is kind of advanced. I don't, I'm not like completely able to wrap my mind around it myself, but basically it takes like a lot of advanced stats, like success rate, EPA per play. Essentially what it does is it boils them down to a number that represents the point spread that a team would be either favored by, or I don't know what the opposite of favored by is like supposed to lose by that a team would be like favored by against an average team on a neutral field. So ideally you could take an S&P plus number and get like a hypothetical point spread of like two teams from like different years in college football who've never played each other. Anyway, (laughs) based on Bill Connolly's S&P plus system, Iowa State these last three years was a 57th percentile, 56th percentile, and 60th percentile program. So pretty good teams, not elite. Kenneth Walker's production profile, early on at Wake Forest, he wasn't super involved. He had a 39th percentile dominator rating as a true freshman, but he had like around 600 yards and four touchdowns. I believe almost all all, if not literally all of those 600 yards came on the ground. He didn't catch hardly any passes early on in his career. And then as a year two guy, his dominator rating jumped up to 33%, which is in the 87th percentile for second year guys. That was obviously his breakout year. He broke out at 19.9 years old, which is in the 63rd percentile. And it is worth mentioning that that uptick in dominator rating, which was really significant, did not come with an uptick in like actual yards. He had 596 yards as a freshman, 609 yards as a sophomore, but his touchdowns went up from four to 13. So, you know, I'm not going to like not give him credit for breaking out. He did what he did. But it's worth mentioning that, like, the actual yards he was gaining did not increase by much. And then this last year as a junior, he obviously, like, transferred to Michigan State and blew up. 37% dominator rating, 89th percentile. He had 1,700 yards and 19 touchdowns. And those teams he played on, according to S&P Plus, 33rd percentile, 25th percentile, this last year at Michigan State, 50th percentile. They went 11-2 and two and finished 9th in the AP poll. So it's worth mentioning that S&P Plus, that 50th percentile number, is not doesn't tell you that Michigan State was an average college football team in 2021. Like, they obviously weren't. They were a top 10 team in the country. Because I'm evaluating running backs, that means that relative to the teams of all running backs drafted since 2007, Michigan State in 2021 was a 50th percentile team. Like, running backs who get drafted are the best running backs in the country, and good players typically come from good schools. So Michigan State was a good team relative to the teams of every other running back draft in the last decade and a half. They were fairly average. So I just wanted to clear that up. Kyron Williams at Notre Dame basically did nothing as a true freshman. Seventh percentile dominator rating, only 29 yards, no touchdowns. Didn't play much at all. In year two, he broke out uh, basically the same age as Kenneth Walker. 61st percentile uh, breakout age, 27% dominator rating. This last season in 2021, he had a 30% dominator rating. Those are in the 78th percentile and the 72nd percentiles. And these past two seasons, he had right around 1,400 yards each season, 14 touchdowns, 17 touchdowns. So small guy, came in and was a workhorse both seasons, really productive and on really good teams. They went 11-2, and 10-2, and 11-2 and two during his years on the team. Both of his seasons as a starter, uh, they finished in the top 10 in the AP poll. And in S&P Plus, they were 70th percentile, 
77th percentile and 73rd percentile. So legitimate production on really quality teams for Kyron Williams. So in my in my process, I typically call it a model, but it's not. But the way I do things, I generate like composite scores in each category using like the percentile ranks of these different like relevant metrics. So the quality of a team a guy played on, his age, his dominator rating, things like that. And I generate like scores on a zero to 100 scale based on those percentile ranks. And the production scores of these three guys... 0 to 100, Brees Hall, 85.6, his career production score, Kenneth Walker, 71.0, Kyron Williams, 68.8. So, Brees Hall up here at the top, he's got the highest one in the class, obviously, and then a little bit of a drop down, but still pretty solid scores, like good scores from Kenneth Walker and Kyron Williams. And then using the same mixture of metrics that I use to generate those scores, I'm also able to generate comps. And so I can look at those few data points and find the historical prospects who are the most similar in those data points to generate production comps for like current prospects. For Brees Hall, I'll give you the top four. Those guys are James Conner, Ray Rice, Jaquiz Rogers, and LaShawn McCoy. So three like Pro Bowl level NFL players, and then a guy in Jaquiz Rogers who was a really talented player. He just happened to be 5'6", and like those dudes just don't get run in the league. So pretty solid comps for Brees Hall. For Kenneth Walker, those four guys are David Montgomery, Giovanni Bernard, Jordan Todman, and Vic Ballard. So a bit of a mixed bag, uh, some like RB2, borderline RB1 level guys there, and then some dudes who just kind of weren't a thing in the NFL. Part of that is fleshed out in like, well, they were productive, but did they catch the ball well? Were they athletic? Did they have the size? Did they run the ball well? But just looking at like, you know, bird's eye view production, kind of a mixed bag for Kenneth Walker. Um, and then Kyron Williams, LaMichael James, Sean Moreno, Jeremy Hill, Giovanni Bernard. So some solid guys there too. Let's move on to the rushing efficiency profiles for each of these guys. So Brees Hall carried the ball 718 times in his college career. That's an 87th percentile number. So a lot of work for him. He was immediately a workhorse as a freshman, carried that load for three years, a lot of touches. His team relative efficiency numbers, his yards per carry was 0.65 yards higher than though than that of his teammates. That's a 56th percentile number, so just above average. His 10-yard run rate over his career was actually lower than the rest of the guys on the team. It's a 36th percentile number, so that's a little interesting. Uh, he was really good in the open field, though. His breakaway conversion rate, so how often was he turning his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs, was 38%, which is an 81st percentile number, so really nice in the open field. The context required to kind of sift through what those things mean. The level of, you know, talent that the guys he was playing with had, you know, we're comparing his yards per carry to his teammates. How good were those teammates? They averaged just over three stars as high school recruits in the 42nd percentile. So a slightly below average group, but Brees Hall was seeing more defenders in the box than they were. His 0.22 more defenders he was facing is an 86th percentile like discrepancy between their box counts. And so if you account for that, the average Brees Hall carry was worth 125% of the average carry of all the other running backs like collectively at Iowa State during his career, which is in the 81st percentile. I recently uh, have been dabbling in another metric, which I'm calling relative success rate, which is basically the same thing as box adjusted efficiency rating, which takes like yards per carry, compartmentalizes by box count, and then finds a weighted average. Relative success rate doesn't look at a, a yard per carry average. It looks at the how often a guy is succeeding on his runs, which a success would be basically gaining the appropriate amount of yardage given down in distance. It's like 40% of the yards needed on first down, 70% on second down, and then 100% on third or fourth down. So normalizing things for situation, how consistent is this guy in succeeding while running the ball? And Brees Hall's relative success rate, given the box counts he was carrying against relative to his teammates, just a 46th percentile number greater than his teammates by 1%, but that's just a 46th percentile number. And Brees Hall's kind of particular mix of rushing efficiency numbers is a little bit of a red flag to me. Obviously, he was more efficient than than the guys on his team. Not by much and not relative to great teammates, but what's most interesting to me is that he had a low 10-yard run rate, relatively low relative success rate, which success rate is just kind of a better version of 10-yard run rate as far as I'm concerned. Before I had access to box count data, using 10-yard run rate was like a proxy for success rate. Now I have that, I don't need to use 10-yard run rate as much. So, high per carry efficiency relative to his teammates, relatively low success rate. So, kind of what that calls into question, especially given his high breakaway conversion rate, is is his high efficiency 
fueled by these long runs despite a relative lack of consistency. Kind of the way I classify guys who fall into that is with the, a thing I call the Jeremy McNichols corollary because he's kind of like the poster boy for that. He was a beast in college, very efficient, but his 10-yard run rate was low, breakaway conversion rate very high. And so kind of what that indicates to me is a guy who is succeeding based on like athleticism and big plays while not maybe necessarily having like vision, the ability to like effectively manipulate linebackers at the line of scrimmage and do like the little things required to like be successful down in a down out. So some guys from the past who kind of also fall into that category, Kenneth Dixon, Ronald Jones, Amir Abdullah, Tevin Coleman, LaMichael James, Chuba Hubbard, all very good, very efficient college running backs who have not seen the level of success in the NFL that you would have expected from their prospect profiles. And so given that, a little bit of a red flag for Brees Hall, a little bit of bust risk. Let's move on to Kenneth Walker. He did not see quite as much volume. His 481 carries are above average in the 52nd percentile, but all the other rushing efficiency metrics, he crushes. He averaged 1.5 yards per carry greater than his teammates, 85th percentile. His chunk rate, 5% higher than his teammates, 84th percentile. Breakaway conversion rate, 40%. 89th percentile. He saw the same relative box count that Brees Hall saw. His teammates were a little worse, slightly less than three stars um, as high school recruits in the 34th percentile. But given the box counts he was facing, the average Kenneth Walker carry was worth 146% the per carry output of the rest of the guys on the team, which is, I mean, if you think about it, if the rest of his team is averaging five yards per carry and he's getting essentially 150% of what they're getting, that's the equivalent of him averaging seven and a half yards per carry. That's nuts. Very high. I believe that's like, yeah, 96th percentile. And his relative success rate, 94th percentile. He was 9% higher in like box adjusted success rate relative to his teammates. So per carry average, great. Success rate, great. Kenneth Walker is simply like one of the best pure runners we've seen come out in some time. He's very, very good. Kyron Williams, a little bit uh, less volume, 419 carries in the 41st percentile, and his team relative efficiency is not awesome. His yards per carry plus was 0.03, which is in the 30th percentile, so he's basically has the same yard per carry average as all the other dudes on the team. He wasn't great in the open field, 29%, 45th percentile. His 10-yard run rate was actually 2% higher than his teammates, which is in the 63rd percentile, so that's solid. If you're not going to have a great yards per carry, I'd rather you have a high chunk rate versus a high breakaway conversion rate so you don't have the problem that Brees Hall might have. But those guys that uh, he played with at Notre Dame, just over three stars as high school recruits, 43rd percentile, and he actually saw slightly lighter box counts than they did. His relative box count was just in the 46th percentile, and unfortunately, given those box counts, His box-adjusted efficiency rating was just 106.4%, which is 23rd percentile. So the average Kyron Williams carry, given the box counts he was running against, was greater than his teammates, but not impressive relative to historical running back prospects. And his relative success rate, very much the same thing, slightly higher than his teammates, only in the 33rd percentile. So Kyron Williams does not look like an incredibly effective runner of the football, at least from like an efficiency standpoint. Their composite rushing efficiency scores, Brees Hall earned a 69.2 out of 100. Kenneth Walker earned an 87.6. Kyron Williams earned a 32.3, which is, I mean, obviously out of 100, that's not good. And their their comps. Uh, The comps uses all of the team relative stats that don't include the box count data. I have not been able to, like, incorporate the box count data into the comps yet. But given the team relative stats, the, you know, breakaway conversion rate, things like that, the rushing efficiency comps for Brees Hall, which also takes into account, like, projected measurables. And I'm assuming all of these guys run a 4-5 or at the combine, just kind of as a placeholder 40 time. But the pure runner comps for Brees Hall are Jeremy McNichols, ugh, James Conner, Keyshawn Vaughn, and Andre Williams. Little bit of a mixed bag. Little bit of a red flag. The pure runner comps for Kenneth Walker are Travis Etienne, Alex Collins, Sony Michelle, Duke Johnson. I like that list. All of them, I guess, you could say are a little bit questionable. Like, Travis Etienne hasn't yet succeeded in the NFL. Alex Collins was a good runner, didn't last long. Sony Michelle is kind of a running joke in Dynasty at this point, but, like, he's a guy that NFL teams like, and he gets volume and is good. And then Duke Johnson was always a very efficient player on low volume. So I happen to like the comps. Some other people might have a different opinion. I think they're good. For Kyron Williams, those comps are Miles Sanders, Jeremy Langford, Tony Pollard, and Bishop Sankey. 
not great. And, uh, okay, let's move on to receiving chops. So, starting with Brees Hall, he had 82 receptions in his college career. That's an 89th percentile number. And his target share, his career best target share at Iowa State, 11% in the 67th percentile. And one way I like to kind of contextualize the size of a guy's receiving role is relative to the size of his overall role in the offense. Basically based on the idea that, like, even equal target shares are not necessarily created equally. If I am a... If I'm Jay Ajayi at Boise State and I have a 40% dominator rating and a 10% target share, it's very possible that I'm a large part of the passing game simply because I'm the best player on the team and have a large role in the offense overall in general. Jay Ajayi is not a great receiver. He had a high target share relative to his dominator rating, not incredibly high. Versus a guy like... Alvin Kamara in college, whose dominator rating was maybe only 20-25%, for him to have a 10% target share, or like, you know, 15% like he actually had or whatever it was, that's a little bit more significant as far as how it speaks to his ability as a receiver. His overall role in the offense was not incredibly high. His role as a receiver, especially relative to that, was very high. So, equal target shares not created equally. The metric I kind of developed to describe that relationship is called satellite score. And in that, Brees Hall scores in the 31st percentile. So he was involved as a receiver, not incredibly involved relative to his overall role. And that would kind of put him in the same range of guys like Zach Moss, Dalvin Cook, Jonathan Taylor, Carlos Hyde, like dudes who can catch the ball, but it's not like they're, it's not like their thing, you know, like Jonathan Taylor is a fine receiver. It's not a big part of his game. Brees Hall's usage as a receiver was also not incredibly dynamic. He was split out wide less than 5% of the time, or in the slot or out wide less than 5% of the time. It's in the 25th percentile. His average depth of target was backwards, negative 0.6 average depth of target in the 30th percentile, but he was efficient. He averaged a 70th percentile yards per target and a 75th percentile catch rate. So while he's not being asked to do like a lot of advanced things, he's catching the ball behind the line of scrimmage, generally just lining up in the backfield. He was efficient on his targets and he doesn't have an issue really with catching the ball. So solid, not spectacular. Kenneth Walker, very bad. Uh, He only had 19 receptions in his college career. That's 13th percentile. His target share is a 5% target share in the 14th percentile, and his satellite score is in just the 7th percentile. Obviously, he was dominant, 37% dominator rating, 5% target share. Especially relative to his large role in the offense, he was incredibly uninvolved as a receiver. So, that puts him in the same range as guys like Jordan Howard, Ronald Jones, Nick Chubb, Adrian Peterson, these just like traditional two-down backs. Most of those guys are pretty big. Ronald Jones is the smallest one there. He gets the least run. Ronald Jones is probably a better player than Jordan Howard. He plays less because he's small, doesn't speak well to Kenneth Walker's potential to have a sizable role in the NFL. Usage, also not dynamic, as you would expect. 21st percentile uh, slot and wideout snaps. Also a negative A dot, negative 0.7, 29th percentile. Sometimes you come across a guy who wasn't very involved as a receiver, like A.J. Dillon was like this. Not very involved, but incredibly efficient. A.J. Dillon averaged like 15 yards per reception in college, something like that. So just like ridiculous efficiency, even though he was lightly used, Green Bay coaches saw that, thought they could use him as a receiver, and he's been decent there as a pro. Not the case for Kenneth Walker. 4.6 yards per target is in the 16th percentile. 61% catch rate is in the 5th percentile. Not good. There's almost no indication that Kenneth Walker will be a quality receiver in the NFL. Kyron Williams, very different story. He had 78 receptions in college. I think that's a... Yeah, it's his 96th percentile mark. Very good. And his target share was 13% in the 83rd percentile. His satellite score, also high. So he had a high target share and high relative to his role in the offense. 43.7, which is a 79th percentile number, puts him in the range of guys like CJ Spiller, Danny Woodhead, Michael Carter, like solid receiving backs who also could play on first and second down. And his usage was pretty good. He was split out wider in the slot. 13% of the time, 72nd percentile. His A dot was also negative, but just barely. It's in the 41st percentile. And he was relatively efficient. 6.8 yards per target is in the 57th percentile. His catch rate, right around 79% in the 61st percentile. Percentile. So not incredible efficiency, but above average, and especially given his fairly dynamic usage, his large role, I'm pretty confident he's going to be a good receiver in the NFL. The composite receiving chop scores for these guys, Brees Hall 54.6, Kenneth Walker 16.5, Kyron Williams 73.5. So we've got Kyron Williams up here at the top, one of the best receivers in the class. Brees Hall is probably just like a passable pass catcher in the league, maybe above average. Kenneth Walker, very unlikely he's involved there much at all. 
I also have comps for these guys here. This one does not take into account like body type or anything. So it's just kind of their role, usage, efficiency as receivers. For Brees Hall, Kadeem Carey, Javid Best, Dion Lewis, and Javante Williams. For Kenneth Walker, Raquel Armstead, Benny Snell, Larry Roundtree, and Kelvin Taylor. And for Kyron Williams, Ido Smith, Joseph Randall, DeAndre Swift, and Baron Batch. Some of those guys you might not have heard of, but DeAndre Swift, Eno Smith, Joseph Randall, it's not bad. So that kind of brings me to like the final word. That's kind of the main kind of points I wanted to touch on, like size. We don't have athletic profiles yet, but size, production, rushing efficiency, receiving ability. Those are kind of like the main components that I focus on that like make up a guy's profile. So kind of the final word on each of these guys. We'll go to Brees Hall first. He's the easy RB1 in this class. He's a big dude. He was an efficient runner very productive college career. And I think he has the ability to play on all three downs, given that he's a fine, unspectacular, but fine pass catcher. He's a complete player. I think there's a little bit of bust risk given the like shape of his rushing efficiency profile. Very Jeremy McNichols-y, which isn't a good look. I'm a little worried about that. But in this running back class, there's just nowhere else to pivot. Like Kenneth Walker's not nearly as complete a player as Brees Hall. Kyron Williams is not nearly as complete a player as Brees Hall. Isaiah Spiller has significant warts that make him, in my opinion, like not fit for the RB1 spot. And beyond those guys, there's not much else either. So it's Brees Hall at the top, not much else to pivot to despite his, you know, kind of red flaggy rushing efficiency. However, given that, This is a weak running back class. I don't think Brees Hall is a weak RB1. Like, the 2023 class is getting a lot of hype. If Brees Hall stayed another year, declared there, he would fit right in with those guys as like a really high-end running back prospect. He would be a quality top three, four, top one running back in a lot of running back classes. So the running back class is weak. Brees Hall is not a weak guy at the top. So yeah, I'll just say that. And his composite score, like if you take all of those, all the data points, the composite score for his profile as a whole is a 74 out of 100, which is in the same range as guys like Joe Mixon, Le'Veon Bell, Steve Slayton, Marshawn Lynch, and his comps, his overall comps, you know, production, receiving, rushing, body type, all of that are James Conner, number one, Le'Veon Bell at number two, and then two interesting ones at three and four, Kadeem Carey and Deion Lewis, both significantly smaller than Brees Hall, but very similar like production profiles, rushing efficiency profiles, receiving profiles, not like intuitive comps, but I would think of him as like big Dion Lewis, which is kind of an attractive player. So that's Brees Hall. Kenneth Walker, absolutely not a complete player at all. There's really almost no indication that he'll be a good receiver in the NFL. I will point out that there's another another really smart guy on Twitter um, at ZWK Football um, has done some like deep dives into the high school receiving stats of a lot of these running backs. And in high school, Kenneth Walker had 64 receptions, 1,056 yards, and 16 touchdowns as a receiver. I honestly just don't know how impressive that is, like relative to like other running back prospects, because I don't track high school stats myself. But it seems better than what he did in college. So at least there's like some history of him having caught the ball and like had some success doing that. I don't know if those were all dump offs. I don't know if he was running routes. I have no idea. But if there's hope for him being a receiver in the NFL, we see glimpses of it in his high school numbers. Other than that, not much indication that he'll be a good receiver in the NFL. And the combine is going to be very, very important for Kenneth Walker, like more important than it might be for any other running back because he needs to be a size that can get work in the NFL despite his deficiencies as a pass catcher. Like the best guy who's like a poor receiver, sub 215 pounds, 5'10 or taller, like the best guys are like Bilal Powell, Chuba Hubbard, Raheem Moster, like Denard Robinson. These are not guys you want on your fantasy team. And if we're propping up Kenneth Walker's like the RB2 in this class, which he might be, like I, I might end up having him there. He absolutely has to be of requisite size. Otherwise I'm going to be out. Like I cannot take a 204 pound guy who doesn't catch the ball, regardless of how good he is on the ground. Like Denard Robinson, Bilal Powell, Chuba Hubbard, Raheem Mostert. These guys are all good runners. I'm not taking them at the 104 in a rookie draft because they don't fit the shape of a guy who gets heavy work in the NFL. I just can't do it. I'm gonna go back in. And for that reason, I'm out. (laughs) I'm still out. His composite score, like overall profile, 62.2 
which is solid. It's not a no doubter. It puts him right in the range of guys like Sony Michelle, Kareem Hunt, TJ Yeldon, Clyde Edwards Elaire. And the comps for him are Alex Collins, Darius Geis, Ryan Matthews, and David Montgomery. The comp machine has a little bit of a hard time finding guys who were as good as he was as a runner, as bad as he was as a receiver and who are at similar size. So those guys are all bigger than him, but I think, especially like Ryan Matthews, you know, maybe Darius Geis, Alex Collins, like similar styles, like not incredibly talented receivers, high quality, just like pure runners. Kenneth Walker is smaller, and that's the concern. For Kyron Williams, basically the thing with him is he was like a good, fine, productive player in college. I know a lot of people love Kyron Williams. He's getting a lot of like Austin Eckler comps. I've seen like Devontae Freeman, Aaron Jones, Chase Edmonds. I really don't see what makes him, like what in the profile indicates that Kyron Williams is more than a satellite back. Yes, he handled like a workhorse role in college. No, he was not efficient relative to his teammates. His efficiency profile is very bad. If our idea of, you know, a three down back is a guy who can both like run between the tackles, handle a heavy load and catch the ball, I think he checks two of those boxes, but he doesn't check the one where he's like a good runner of the football. And like a lot of those guys, like Austin Eckler, Aaron Jones, Chase Edmonds, he was not nearly as efficient in college as those guys were. I think he's much closer to like James White or Naheem Hines in the NFL as far as like role goes, which, you know, we, we've seen excellent fantasy seasons from James White. We've seen useful fantasy seasons from Naeem Hines. I think he can be a useful guy in the NFL. I'm not part of the Kyron Williams is the next Austin Eckler train. I think it's in his range of outcomes. I'm not jumping to that as like, my go-to comp or scenario for his career. His composite profile score is a 60.5, and that puts him in the range of guys like Tevin Coleman, Carrion Johnson, Ronald Jones, Jamal Williams. So, you know, useful guys for the most part, not incredible for fantasy. And strongest comps, Bishop Sankey, Christian McCaffrey, Deion Lewis, Kenneth Gainwell. There's some good guys there. I love Kenneth Gainwell. Deion Lewis was a good player in the NFL, solid fantasy guy for, you know, at least a couple years. Christian McCaffrey, obviously, is, you know, the truth. Bishop Sankey sucked. So, mixed bag for Kyron Williams. We'll see. I also want to touch on Isaiah Spiller just very, very shortly. I'm not going to do a full breakdown, but his composite score here, just as kind of a reference point, is 62.9, which is, you'll notice, is higher than both Kenneth Walker and Kyron Williams. So, the model thinks he's a stronger candidate for RB2 than I do. The model, which I built based on my sensibilities, but the model really values, like, size and pass catching. If you have those two things, you can get on the field. And as I've acknowledged before, like Isaiah Spiller checks the boxes of like being able to get on the field. He'll probably have quality draft capital. I'm very scared that he can't run the ball well. But given that rushing efficiency in the NFL, A, largely doesn't matter for fantasy. You can be productive in fantasy without being an efficient runner. And B, is largely fueled by factors outside the running back's control, like offensive line play, play calling, offensive efficiency overall. Isaiah Spiller could be a fine player and even an efficient player without inherently being a good runner of the football. And because of that, the model likes him, you know, relatively. I think it would still have him lower than consensus does, but likes him more than I do. I'm just scared of the bust risk. His number one comp would be Mike Davis, who I think is a very similar guy. Good size, decent pass catcher, productive in college, not an efficient runner at all in college, and has not done much in the NFL, like maybe as a consequence of his not being actually good at you know, running the football. So scared Isaiah Spiller is kind of on, on that same track. But yeah, I think that'll kind of wrap it up. This was kind of a kind of a blowout for Brees Hall for the most part. I do think it's important to like acknowledge that bust risk that I think his rushing efficiency profile demonstrates. But Kenneth Walker, I'm going to be all in on him as a really solid guy in the first round of rookie drafts if he has the appropriate size at the combine. I like Kyron Williams. I can't reach the heights of the love that I'm seeing for him on Twitter from a lot of these guys. And Isaiah Spiller, I acknowledge it could, it could happen. Very scared. So yeah, I think that'll about wrap it up. It's going to tease my next video. <laughs> Don't remember what it's going to be. Just kidding. Remember what it's going to be. Top 10 running backs pre-combine coming out on Wednesday. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. Until then, peace.